Gary Payton became known as the Michael Jordan stopper because he was assigned as Jordan's primary defender in the final three games of the 1996 NBA Finals, and suddenly Jordan was locked up and the Sonics got back in the series. I used to believe this too, but I recently watched this entire series and realized there's not much truth to this. You will see a big dip in Jordan's stats from games one through three versus four through six, and Gary Payton helped make this happen, but he did not do it alone. It was a team effort. This is why it's important to watch the full games to really know the full story. To quote Yogi Berra, you can observe a lot just from watching. Payton played a role in MJ's shooting struggles in games four and six of the 1996 finals, which you can expect out of that season's defensive player of the year who was nicknamed the glove because of his tenacious defense. You can also expect the Sonics to have other great defenders too, with the second best defensive rating in that NBA season only behind the bulls we all remember this part of the last dance right it took a toll on my it took a toll and then <laughs> so resting him a little bit and then the, the, the series changed and i wish i could have did it earlier i don't know if the outcome would have been different but it, it, it was a difference <laughs> and, and beating him down a little bit the glove i had no problem with the glove I had no problem with Gary Payton. When Michael Jordan said he had no problem with Gary Payton, there is some truth to this. If you go back and watch game one, MJ wanted every bit of Payton when Payton was guarding him. The narrative from this series is that George Carl miscalculated by waiting until game four to assign Payton to guard Jordan. Deadlift Shrimp guarded Jordan to start the series, and that did not go well because Shrimp didn't have the foot speed to keep up with Jordan. However, Gary Payton had his moments guarding Jordan in the first three game so no George Carl did not wait until game four to have Gary Payton guard Michael Jordan he just didn't make Payton Jordan's primary defender because Payton was slightly injured and Carl wanted Payton to have the energy to contribute on offense in game two Hersey Hawkins started out as Jordan's primary defender and the help defender would be the closest guy to the ball MJ went nine for 22 which is just under 41 percent you may be screaming inefficient here but considering this was in the 90s and the rules allowed defense to be tougher back then that's really not that bad for a perimeter player taking the most shots on the biggest stage scotty pippen easily had his best game of the series while playing hurt with 21 points while 8 for 16 with 29 points 8 assists 6 rebounds and 2 steals jordan was more than good enough to get the bulls a game 2 victory to take a 2-0 series lead game 3 was mj's statement game. After his first two games where he was good but not as dominant as he usually is, he scored 36 in game three, his only 30 point game in the series while going 11 for 23 from the field and the Bulls dominated to take a commanding 3-0 lead. Now with nothing to lose, Gary Payton started game four as Jordan's primary defender. Although the part about this adjustment being made in game four is true, what's not true is that Payton was the only factor that gave Jordan a difficult time the rest of the series. Payton had help. Let's break this down. One thing that doesn't get talked about is Nate McMillan, Gary Payton's backup point guard. McMillan made the all-defensive second team in the two years prior to 1996, but then he injured his back during the 1996 conference finals. He tried to play through the pain in game one and only lasted six minutes and came back in game four out of desperation. He would have been assigned to guard Michael Jordan a lot more had he not been hurt and at 6'5", may have done a better job than most guys could guarding Jordan. I don't think McMillan's absence is the main reason the Sonics lost the finals. However, his absence did hurt the Sonics a little bit in the first three games and his return in game four, even without lighting up the box score, gave the Sonics some new life, proving there's a lot more to sports than just stats. The Sonics dismantled the Bulls 106-87 in game four while holding Michael Jordan to 23 points on just 6 of 19 from the field and Scottie Pippen to 12 points points on just 4 of 17. Gary Payton did a good job getting Jordan off his game, but also got some help from his teammates. The Sonics double teamed MJ as soon as he got the ball, which was a strategy they used in the first three games as well, but with Hersey Hawkins being Jordan's primary defender after realizing
realizing Detlef Schrempf isn't quick enough. There were also possessions where Gary Payton was on the floor, but someone else like David Wingate was guarding Jordan. After a rough game four, Michael Jordan had a great game statistically in game five, scoring 26 points while shooting 50%. And just from looking at the box score, it looks like Scottie Pippen, Tony Kukoc, and Steve Kerr really let Jordan down while Ron Harper couldn't play more than a minute due to a knee injury that required surgery after the finals. George Carl said before game five that we can play with the Chicago Wolves and beat them if we don't turn the basketball over. Uh, I think if we control the turnover situation, it's going to be a close game. And he may have had a point because the Sonics had more turnovers than the Bulls in each of the first three games, but in game four and five, the Bulls had more turnovers. Game five, Gary Payton started the game as Michael Jordan's primary defender, but again, he got some help. The guy closest to MJ came to double team every time MJ had the ball. I also noticed on one of MJ's misses early in the game that Payton didn't get around the pick quickly enough to contest the shot. Next possession, MJ beat Payton on a backdoor cut. Overall, from what I saw in game five, I think Peyton was doing the best he can to make Michael Jordan uncomfortable. But once again, he had plenty of help with double teams and switches that were thrown at MJ as soon as he got the ball. There were also some misses from Jordan where Peyton was on the floor, but was not anywhere near him. Percy Hawkins still guarded MJ at times. MJ only scored two points in the fourth quarter of game five of what happened to be an 89 to 78 loss when only down three going into the fourth quarter. So it's fair to say MJ didn't close the game like we usually expect. What happened then? The Sonics did a great job as a team getting the ball out of Jordan's hands by double and triple teaming him. In game six, the Bulls won their fourth championship in spite of Michael Jordan's worst shooting performance. In that game, he scored 22 points while shooting just five of 19 with five turnovers. He still did other things well, dishing out seven assists, grabbing nine rebounds, and had two steals and shot 11 for 12 at the free throw line. Let's get into why he struggled as badly as he did in game six and how the Bulls won in spite of this. First, one thing we can see on the box score is that the Bulls out-rebounded the Sonics 51 to 35 with Dennis Rodman getting 19 of those rebounds. But I also want to talk about what we can't see on the box score. You need to watch the game to know this. Michael Jordan nailed the first shot he took with Gary Payton guarding him. His first miss, Hersey Hawkins contested and there were more possessions later Later on in the game that Hawkins contested and Jordan missed. Early on, there was a lot of scrappy play with the refs swallowing their whistles. We saw David Wingate guard Jordan at times too, and there were some open shots that MJ missed during game six. There was also a point in game six where MJ beat Peyton on a backdoor off a screen from Luke Longley where Sean Kemp met him at the basket to block his shot. There was another backdoor cut later in the game where Jordan beat Peyton, but this time converted. Another thing that that hurt the Sonics in game six was Nate McMillan re-aggravating his back injury after just 10 minutes of play. After watching all six games, yes, Gary Payton deserves some credit for slowing down Jordan, but not nearly as much as he gets. Percy Hawkins and David Wingate deserve more credit than they get for their defense on Jordan. And the same goes for the Sonics interior defense for their help defense, making it harder for Jordan to get to the basket. Nate McMillan also gave the Sonics a spark, even without Without lighting up the box score. The moral of the story is that it's best to watch the games yourself to really know what happened. So what do you think? Please let me know in the comments. Good or bad, I always love reading them. I'm open to what you want me to cover next, so please let me know about that in the comments too. If you enjoyed the video, a like would be much appreciated. If you love sports, please be sure to consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you never miss another video. I'd love to have you as part of the team. Links to my social media are down below in the description. If you would like to see my most recent video or the video that YouTube recommends, both are up above. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.